Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. The rain rolling into San Antonio tonight, the first of several days. We're expecting to have a good chance at rain, and that really tells the story right there. Oh, yeah. Let's bring in meteorologist Adam Kasky, who is tracking it all for us tonight. Adam, what's the latest out there? Well, heavy rainfall, particularly on the west side of San Antonio right now, especially along 1604 on the west side of town and also moving through Bandera County. A lot of lightning and thunder associated with this. Uh, it's allowed rainfall that we have, of course, but a little bit of hail included within some of these clusters of thunderstorms. Not a whole lot of it, but there are pockets of hail so far, not the damaging type of hail that could be changing as we go through the night. But this is what we're watching, particularly the west side of San Antonio, all the way through the north side of town, all the way up toward Canyon Lake. You see this development just over the past hour, stretching all the way down into Bernie. This continues to fill in on the radar screen, and we're anticipating that trend to continue. So more of this filling in of the radar of the showers and storms on the radar. Now the heaviest rain so far and the highest accumulations have been on the far west and northwest side of San Antonio, particularly in and around the Holotus area. Just take a look at some of these rainfall totals so far, and this is just over the past about hour and a half. We can get down into the neighborhood here right along Braun Road near 1604, just south of Bandera Road, and that's where we've already had radar estimates of over two inches of rain. Now this could lead to some flash flooding issues later on tonight if we continue to get the very heavy rainfall on top of it. But then you look to the east side of town, nothing. Of course, the haves and have nots. We'll take a closer look at what's happening outside. Other areas of heavy rainfall we need to talk about and how long it's going to last through the night and more rain chances ahead. A lot to go over, Steve. Yeah, we can still hear it rumbling outside the KSAT studios here. Thank you, Adam. Right now, San Antonio police are searching for answers in a deadly shooting. This was breaking news at the end of the six o'clock newscast. One man was found lying in the middle of a street with multiple gunshot wounds. It was on Chupadera Street on the city's west side. Police found the man just after six tonight. He died on the scene. Investigators detained a man who was found behind a residence. As of right now, that man is being described as a witness. Uh, homicides in the U.S. jumped 30% over the last year. That's according to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the largest one-year jump in more than a decade. As homicides are on that upward trend, cases continue to go unsolved here locally. The night team's Jeffany Gray with a look at the numbers and the change some people are pushing for. He was my brother. Elisa Salinas and her family have been in mourning since Friday. San Antonio police found her brother, 50-year-old Roy Salinas Jr., with multiple stab wounds on the sidewalk along Enrique M. Barrera Parkway. She says the last time she talked to Roy was two days before he was killed. He's not here no more, and I'm like, well, where is he? And they said that he had passed away. And Roy's homicide is just one of many being investigated as we speak. SAPD and the Bear County Sheriff's Office together reported 146 homicides to the FBI for 2020. That's up 30 from 2019. The increase is a trend that's reflected on the national level. The FBI reported homicides climbed to 21,570. That's a 4,901 more cases than 2019, a 29.4% increase. It's the largest one-year jump since the early 90s as drug wars rocked the country. Officials attributed the dramatic uptick to factors like the pandemic, conflicting politics, and people, quote, generally having too much time. Whatever the reason you're taking somebody's life, you don't have that permission or authority to do so. Community leader Rosita Wilson with the Stop in the Name of Love movement started the movement to combat violence after a Super Bowl Sunday shooting broke out at her East Side church this year. She feels there are three things that could reduce violence in our community community involvement, it is community activity, it's community education. The motive behind Roy's fatal stabbing is still unknown at this time, but his sister hopes his death inspires the community to help investigators with any unsolved homicide case. Don't be afraid because these people are cowards. A San Antonio police say at this time there are no witnesses. They have no suspects uh, for Roy's death. But again, they're urging anyone with any information that can help in the investigation to call their homicide unit. That number is 210-207-7635. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News.
Thank you, Jaffany. A sexual assault investigation leading to the arrest of an Alamo Heights ISD employee. So far, one alleged victim has come forward. Police are investigating to find out whether there may be any others. 41-year-old James Lachlan accused of giving a teen girl liquor in late July before he allegedly sexually assaulted her. Castle Hills police say if other potential victims are out there, call their department. That number is 210-342-2341. One man stabbed and left for dead. The suspect remains on the run tonight, but police have the car the killer is believed to have used to get away. San Antonio police are hoping it will help them track down the person who stabbed 40-year-old Christopher Olivares. He was found outside his home on Saturday morning. His family hopes anyone who knows something will say something. If there's anybody out there that knows who did this, you know, uh, please come forward. I want justice. If you have any information, police are asking you contact the homicide unit at the number on your screen. Another mass vaccination site set to offer the Pfizer booster shot tomorrow. The Alamo Dome will be open to eligible Pfizer recipients for that third dose of a vaccine at their drive through clinic. That will be happening from noon to 8 p.m. every Wednesday through Friday. So who's eligible for the Pfizer booster? Well, people who originally got the Pfizer vaccine who are 65 and older or who are 18 and older with an underlying medical condition or who work in a high risk environment. The Wonderland of the Americas Mall is another mass vaccination site offering that Pfizer booster. The downward trend in COVID-19 cases continuing in San Antonio, but there continues to be a strain on local hospitals with more than 700 COVID-19 patients hospitalized. In the past seven days, San Antonio has seen about 600 COVID-19 cases a day. Fighting the flu also important amid this pandemic. Metro Health saying flu shots can be administered at the same time as the COVID-19 vaccine. In fact, we recommend that as being a best practice so free people can be up to date with the vaccination when they show up for COVID vaccinations. You can get your flu shot and COVID-19 vaccine at your local pharmacy. Several local pharmacies are also providing those booster shots. Voters in the southern and eastern parts of Bear County headed to the polls to decide who will lead District 118. A runoff expected there after none of the candidates received more than 50% of the vote. John Lujan, a Republican who once held this seat, is in the lead with 42% of the vote. Frank Ramirez, a Democrat, trailing him with 20% of the vote. That seat in the 118th district left vacant after Leo Pacheco, a Democrat, resigned to accept a position with San Antonio College. Governor Greg Abbott will need to decide on when that runoff will happen. The future of Texas politics is on the line. Literally, the lines could determine how much money your school and community programs receive. They are being drawn right now. We're talking about redistricting. It's done every 10 years after census results. The process is vital to our representation in Washington, D.C. This week, Texas lawmakers started drafting out new congressional maps. The final versions are supposed to reflect the population growth, but so often they rarely do. The night team's Petty Santos tells us how you can get involved in having a say as lawmakers become map makers. Ask some young voters about Texas politics and redistricting, and they'll give you an honest answer. Politics is just not something that I really get into. I feel like a lot of it is just a show. Most people don't pay attention probably because they feel like it doesn't affect them or they just, you know, they're just oblivious and just go on about their lives. But they do care about what's going on in their communities. For me, 100% giving you know, money back to communities and to the schools. That's why what's going on this week at the Senate Committee on Redistricting is something Texans should be laser focused on. It means we get two more electoral votes going into 2024. It has a lot to do with money and what what people can get from their member of Congress in terms of allocations for their districts, everything from grant money to people being appointed to military academies. It has an impact. UTSA professor John Taylor says so where you fall into the potential new redistricting maps could end up impacting your everyday life. Right now, with Republicans in charge, the lines could lean in their favor. The first map draft released this week appears to leave out minorities in communities like in the district represented by Chip Roy, where the population grew. You're talking about marginalizing 
people of color who are, are the ones who are basically driving Texas population growth and therefore, by the way, also driving the Texas economy and everything from education to 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 infrastructure. He explains the redrawing of districts gets political because what happens in Texas impacts the nation. One party leads to either continued control of the House by the Democrats or control by overturning, basically by, by winning the 2022 midterms and Republicans take over again. And if that happens, <laughs> Joe Biden really doesn't have much of a chance of getting anything else passed between now and 2024. And the Senate Special Committee is expected to have um, some final maps by early October. But as redistricting has in the past, uh, this is probably going to get end up uh, being drawn out in the courts. If you want to have a say in how redistricting affects you this time around, you can call the Senate Special Committee on Redistricting. And we have that list on KSAT.com. Steve, Myra. All right. Thank you, Patty. Redistricting is a topic the KSAT Explains team has tackled in depth. We explore why some of these districts look so odd, why that practice has been in play for decades and the challenges ahead as Texas lawmakers redraw these maps. You can catch this episode online right now on KSAT.com slash explains on demand or stream the episode on our KSAT TV app. Military members called before Congress to discuss the exit strategy in Afghanistan. We're hearing from America's top military commanders coming up. And a policy the state used to place migrants in handcuffs called into question in court. How a judge is ruling on that matter next on The Night Beat. Governor Greg Abbott's policy of arresting migrants for trespassing at the border called into question a state district judge now granting a motion to release nearly 250 migrants. That's according to the Texas Tribune. Texas law requires defendants to be released from jail if prosecutors fail to file charges quickly. A trespassing charge means those charges would need to be filed within 15 to 30 days, depending on the severity. The Texas Tribune reports nearly 250 migrants were held behind bars for more than a month. And just yesterday, about 900 migrants were held in jail. And migrants are legally allowed to give themselves up at the border and seek asylum, but COVID is being used as a reason for that not always being so clear cut. It's a process we saw play out in Del Rio earlier this month. As a matter of fact, just last week with thousands of Haitian migrants waiting to be processed. That camp is cleared now, but the White House says they continue to turn people away along the border under what's called Title 42 amid this pandemic. Those who make their way into the immigration process could be in detention centers or given an ankle monitor to wear as they wait for their cases to be heard. Uh, it's not an easy process or an easy system and absolutely nothing is guaranteed. It has to go through our own immigration process. Uh, but again, our system is broken, needs to be fixed. That's what we'd love to work with Republicans on. Migrants who were brought into the country as children grew up recognizing the U.S. as their home. The White House is taking steps to place the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or DACA program in the Federal Register to protect that policy. America's top military commanders are testifying publicly for the first time since the United States pulled out of Afghanistan, ending America's longest war. John Lawrence with the latest. Maybe we're going to remember you three as the three that broke the military. I don't know. America's top military commanders facing a contentious grilling from lawmakers on Capitol Hill Tuesday on the United States' deadly and chaotic withdrawal of Afghanistan. General, I think you should resign. Secretary Austin, I think you should resign. I think this mission was a catastrophe. I think there's no other way to say it, and there has to be accountability. I respectfully submit it should begin with you. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin defending the exit, testifying the U.S. didn't believe Afghanistan would fall in a matter of days. The fact that the Afghan army that we and our partners trained simply melted away in many cases without firing a shot, took us all by surprise. CENTCOM Commander General Kenneth McKenzie and Joint Chiefs Chairman General Mark Milley seemed to contradict President Biden, who said this back in August. Your top military advisors warned against withdrawing on this timeline. They wanted you to keep about 2,500 troops. No, they didn't. It was split. That, that wasn't true. 
Later, Millie and McKenzie said those assessments were their personal opinions and that they would not discuss their specific recommendations to the president. I recommended that we maintain 2,500 troops in Afghanistan. General Milley, I assume you agree with that in terms of the recommendation of 2,500? I do agree with that. I'm John Lawrence reporting. Let's take a look outside with live cam tonight. Some big rain. We've saw big thunder, that lightning still continuing out there. We've got some good storms in our area tonight. Yeah, not everybody's getting hit right now. You know, you go to the east side of Bear County in San Antonio, southeast side. What rain? They're but, wondering what we're talking about. <laughs> we're going to show you what we're yeah. talking about in one moment. The really heavy rain falls particularly on the west side of town. So we have some areas or pockets of heavy rain tonight where already a couple of inches of rain has been estimated by the Doppler radar. We'll get into that in a moment. Also more rain chances in the days ahead. This isn't it. This isn't just one and done. And particularly Friday and Saturday stand out in my mind as high potential days for soaking rainfall. OK, let's get right to the uh, radar here and take a look at the activity outside. And there you have it filling in over the past hour or two. That's the the last hour you're looking at on the radar. But the last two hours is really when it started to come together. And overall, we're going to, I think, continue to see this over the next several hours and start to taper off after midnight and especially closer to sunrise. This activity shouldn't be too much left of it. So taking a look at the radar now, the heaviest rain forming along this outflow boundary, basically from Austin southwestward all the way to Canyon Lake and into Bernie. It continues to fill in. So we're still seeing this development, particularly north of San Antonio and Bulverde, Bergheim, Ber Bernie areas. That's where it's particularly particularly filling in. So that's where you'll start to see the ponding of water on the roadways. I know most people at home tonight just enjoy the pitter patter of the rain on the roof. Hopefully it helps you sleep. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of lightning associated with it. Those white lines, they indicate the lightning strikes and those lightning strikes. Whenever we have a lot of them, they tend to knock out power for a few folks. I'm not expecting widespread power outages, but some little outages or brief outages here and there can be anticipated whenever we have lightning on the map. Even though these are not severe thunderstorms, they don't fit the criteria of large enough hail or high enough winds that may change through the night. And that's why we're going to stay here with you through the night, especially on the case 12 weather authority app as we can broadcast live there. OK, let's get right into the radar of this. Look at the heavy rainfall. These purples that you see here on the map near Gray Forest neighborhood, Dominion, the Rim, almost La Cantera, that those little purple spots indicate the potential for hail, just small hail, likely not damaging hail, but the kind that you'll hear, you'll notice it outside. But as of now, it's nothing to worry about. Rainfall rates, they're high. Now keep in mind what you're going to see with these numbers is a rate per hour. It's not going to rain for a whole hour at this rate, but you get just west of I-10 here, north of San Antonio, between San Antonio and Bernie, and you're looking at nearly six inches per hour of rain. That's how heavy it's coming down if it were to rain for a full hour at that rate. We all know it's not going to rain for a full hour at that rate, but we have already seen these little yellow areas on the map indicating rainfall accumulations on the order of about two inches or more. But then you look east side of San Antonio, south east side of town, nothing yet. We are expecting a little more development and the radar to fill in a little bit more as we go through time, particularly this activity down here starting to drift northeast where it may not have the heavy rain with it, but at least some soaking rain at times with it. OK, we're going to move on here again. I mentioned toward the morning commute, the activity it starts to taper off. We'll still have some wet roads likely for the morning commute, but then tomorrow afternoon, mainly dry, some sunshine, Saturday, Thursday, some scattered afternoon showers and storms. Friday and Saturday really stand out as the likelihood of more widespread soaking rain off and on throughout those days. Okay, thank you, Adam. All right, Greg Popovich continues with the youth movement. Yes, and in this particular case, it is a young roster, perhaps one of the youngest rosters in the history of the Spurs with the oldest coach. Maybe I should have phrased that differently. More, most experienced coach. I'm a little sensitive to the word oldest these days. <laughs> yeah, the most experienced sports guesser. Thank you, Steve. And Micah Parsons better. Is he better than we thought? Coming up.
the San Antonio Spurs tip off their 2021-2022 regular season, they'll do so with one of the youngest rosters in team history. Gone are veterans such as DeMar DeRozan, Patty Mills, and Rudy Gay, who have combined 39 years of NBA experience. A training camp roster the Spurs release on Monday has an average age of 18 players set at 24 and a half years old. Playing for the coach, who is the longest tenured coach in all of North American sports, beginning his 26th season with the silver and black at 72 years old. That fact has not been lost on Lonnie Walker IV, who's about to start his fourth season in the NBA at 22 years old. It's funny because his birthday, when, when, he, when his birthday passed, uh, I told him, I was like, isn't it crazy to think that you're older than my grandparents? <laughs> but um, he still works out with the best of us. Every single day he's on the treadmill, he's doing defensive slides on the court, and he's lifting. So um, it's pretty impeccable to see a guy like that doing what he's doing. Again, the most experienced. The Spurs' first preseason game will be this Monday against Utah at the AT&T Center. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys dominated the Philadelphia Eagles on Monday Night Football that generated a whopping 41-21 victory. One reason why was a Dallas D. Trayvon Diggs became the first Dallas Cowboy to have three interceptions in the first three games of the season since Everson Walls in 1985. His third return for 59 yards for a touchdown. The first interception return for a touchdown by a Dallas player since Byron Jones in 2017. And the versatility of linebacker Micah Parsons, who was playing more from the defensive end position, to try and keep Jalen Hurts corralled. He led the team with five quarterback pressures, four tackles, one tackle for a loss, one quarterback hit, and one pass breakup. When did Parsons know Dallas had Philly on the ropes? I would say as soon as Diggs had that pick right coming out of half, I mean, I saw the whole energy low, um, the whole momentum shifts. I mean, when you got contagious energy, everybody just excited to see each other make those type of plays. I mean, it's hard to come back from that. And, I, and that's one thing I like about this team. Like, everybody can eat, you know, and just one person out there making plays. There's a whole bunch of people making plays. And it's just so contagious right now. And I just like the momentum we got going on. And we just got to keep doing it one week at a time. All right, up next, undefeated Carolina Sunday at noon. Five Texas Aggies have dropped out of the college football top 10, according to the Associated Press poll, following their unexpected 20 to 10 loss to Arkansas, replaced them in the top 10 at number eight, while the Aggies fell to 15, following their first loss since Alabama almost one year ago to the day. Now they prepare to host Mississippi State this Saturday. Disappointed in our deal, but at the same time, there's a lot of good things that happen in the game, and it's one game. And But you know what? We can't let one game become two. We've got to come back and practice with even better habits, hopefully get a couple guys back if we can get them back, and play at a better level and play more consistent all the way across the board in all three phases. And we've got a very tough opponent this week, Mississippi State. All right, kick off in Aggieland on Saturday, set for 6 p.m. The big game and our big game coverage next. The big game and our big game coverage this Friday night will be Madison against Reagan. Both the Mavericks and the Rattlers coming into this district 28-6A showdown undefeated in the district with the Mavs 2-0 and likewise the Rattlers at 2-0. But the Mavericks are one step ahead of the Rattlers in the district standings because they have a better overall record at 3-1 compared to Reagan's 2-2. Both are coming off wins. For Madison, it was a 21-9 victory over Churchill two weeks ago after having the last week off. And for Reagan, it was a 45-0 route over Lee. Now they face off to decide who remains unbeaten in district and keep their playoff hopes alive. Since middle school, we've been playing against these same kids, so it is a little rivalry, but, you know, they got a good team, we got a good team, so we're going to see what's up Friday. I think this game is it's just a stepping stone to the rest of the season. It's an obstacle for us to get to playoffs. Madison's ranked top 10. I mean, I don't think anybody outside of this program has faith in us, and I think, um, I think we do. And once we get that win, I think uh, we're going to get our feet back under us and, and uh, keep rolling. All right, kickoff between Madison and Reagan at Hero Stadium this Friday night will be at 7 p.m. We'll be there live both at 5 and 6 on Friday. Some great action. District 28-6A tonight. Brandeis taking on Clark, looking for avenging a five-set loss to the Cougars earlier this year. Broncos up two sets to none. Rolling in the third, Carly Ferris with a no-look one-handed dumb shot. Brandeis up by four. Clark responds. Ariana Roberson sends a spike to the back line. Cougars cut the lead down to three, but Brandeis just too good tonight. Ferris calls a game with another dump shot on match point. Broncos win it. Three sets to none, and they're eight and one in district play. Over at Littleton Gym, Johnson taking on Madison. Mavericks up by a set, but the Jaguars are rallying. Hannah Spencer springs, brings the hammer down. That spike ties it up at four, but Madison answers right back. Mia Dorsey drills one off the block and down. Mavericks win the set. Match three sets to one. We'll have more highlights from these two matches and also from Bernie versus New Braunfels Davenport on our website later tonight. Thank you, Greg. You got it. We'll be right back. 
Tomorrow morning, a few lingering showers and some wet roadways regardless. 72 to start, 91 by the afternoon. And you look at the rain chances, a few possible tomorrow afternoon and Thursday afternoon, but Friday and Saturday really stand out for the best chance of more widespread off and on soaking rain near 80.